So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Insects and Hedgerows talk by Kate Jones from Bug Life, brought to you by CPRE, the Countryside Charity. In a moment, we'll hear about why our hedgerows are essential for invertebrates and other animals. But before we start, um, I'd like to point you to our website, cprinshopshire.org.uk, where you can find uh, a host of valuable resource on hedgerows and how and why we should be protecting them. There are some, uh, there are also more details about our upcoming talks, walks and workshops, um, as well as past recordings of talks that we've already had. Uh, there is one space available on the next Hedgerow workshop uh, this weekend due to a cancellation. The workshop is um, uh, on, on the 13th and the 14th of November at Acton Scott. It's a two day workshop for an adult. It's free of charge. So if you want to take up that opportunity, please contact Sarah Jameson. And the next talk is by Adele uh, uh, Nizadar um, on foraging and hedgerows. That's on the 8th of December. There are some tickets left, uh, but so far we're all so sold out on most talks. So please do book now and, and keep an eye on, on uh, any potential dropping out of uh, future talks. Uh, we're seeking people to help us plant new trees uh, and hedges this winter. Uh, check out our hedge planting page on our website um, and you can book onto the dates you want via the online form or email Sarah Jameson on admin at cpreshopshire.org.uk. At CPRE, we are passionate about hedgerows, among other uh, things to protect the countryside, after all, it was CPRE, or CPRE was one of the organisations that right at its inception, we were one of the first organisations um, to help deliver some of the first planning and hedgerow legislation. So after today, if you're thinking about what you can do to support our aims, please visit cpre.org.uk forward slash get involved. Now I do have the great pleasure of handing over to Kate Jones, who is from uh, Bug Life. Um, she is the Beelines Project Officer to give us an insight into what it really takes to protect a bug's life in the English hedgerow. Uh, thank you, Connor. Um, hello, everyone. Right, I will um, just share my screen. Uh, this is where... Okay, so everyone should be able to see a full screen of my slides. Um, could I just get you to confirm that, Connor? Is that okay? Yep, I'm doing fine. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Yes, hello everyone. Thank you to CPRE for uh, inviting me to talk this evening on um, the importance of hedgerows in our landscape, particularly in relation to pollinators. Um, yeah, so I'm Kate Jones. I'm a conservation officer with Bug Life. I'm the lead on the Seven Bee Lines project, which is uh, building Shropshire's pollinator highway. And uh, just the layout of the talk this evening, I've got a little bit, just run over briefly who Bug Life are, uh, what the bee lines, um, what are bee lines, uh, what the seven bee lines project looks like, and then I'm going to move into um, pollinators and hedgerows. So uh, Bug Life uh, used to be actually known as the Invertebrate Conservation Trust, um, but changed their name to, to Bug Life um, just because it rolls off the tongue easier. Um, we're the only organisation in Europe devoted to the conservation of all invertebrates, and our aim is quite simple, but incredibly ambitious, um, and we're working quite hard with a, with a fairly small team. I think there's, two, there's 27 of us across the UK, uh, and we're working to stop invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates. So, uh, no small task. I just thought I'd put a bit about me, mainly as a disclaimer that I'm that I'm that I'm not an entomologist. Um, I think when you say you work for Bug Life, uh, 
uh, they, they assume you're an entomologist, but I'm, I'm generally much more, well, generally a generalist and a bit of a jack of all trades, I suppose. So I'm the project officer and have been since March 2021, uh, started on, on the Seven Bee Lines project. Before that, work, I worked in natural flood management in Staffordshire with the Wildlife Trust. And prior to that, I was five years in practical hab habitat management with the National Trust. Uh, I've got an MSc in wildlife management and conservation, and I'm a recent hedge laying course completer. I actually went on one of CPRE's hedge laying courses uh, run by Really Rural um, down in South Shropshire the other day, and it, it was great, highly recommend. So if there is anyone that's up for that last space on the hedge laying course at the weekend, I would definitely jump on it. Um, it was really, really, really good course. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And I'll move on to, to what are bee lines. So if you haven't heard about bee lines before, first off, the B stands for biodiversity. Um, we are uh, building these using pollinators as um, our in really, I suppose, but there are multiple benefits for, for wildlife across the board. And that is the bee lines there on that map, that red network across the UK. It's a connected network of three kilometre wide pathways across the whole of the UK linking our, wild, our key wildflower rich habitats. Now, I have got a video. Um, I'm going to see, I think I might, do you know what? I'm actually not going, I'm actually not going to play it. Um, it's, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, it's just a short video um, surmising what Bee Lines is. Um, but uh, yeah, I, if, if, if you can go and have a little look at, at it after, the, after this talk. Um, but um, yeah, essentially, it, it's connecting those habitats up. So the mapping process, it was it was 10 years in the making that bug life were working on, working uh, using local and national data sets and then ground truthing that by having um, stakeholder meetings in each county with some of the local NGOs and, and people working in that area. And it connects the best existing fragments that we have. So our sites of special scientific interest, our SSSIs, our county wildlife sites, other non-designated sites, local wildlife sites. And in each county, there's, a pro there's, should, there's approximately two lines running east to west and two running north to, north to south. That's per county. And if we fill 10% of those bee lines with wildflower rich habitat, that's about 300 hectares in 10 kilometers, then we start to deliver habitat connectivity. So it's incredibly ambitious. Um, but that's the kind of blueprint of, of where we want to create habitat in the UK. And when the mapping was carried out, uh, these were the key habitat types that were used to uh, build, build that framework. So you've got your key ones at the top there and then the beneficial ones. Now, hedgerows aren't mentioned in there in their own right, but they're definitely in there as part of some of the other habitats that are mentioned. So open mosaic habitat or, or scrub, traditional orchards, broadly semi-natural woodland, uh, wood pasture and parkland. Hedgerows play a part in, in those. Um, so they are in there. And this is a bit of this is I think this is the only doom and gloom slide in, in the um, in the presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, essentially they're needed. Uh, I was actually on a climate march on Saturday and um, yeah, we're just because we are facing uh, a cru critical time in in human history, uh, catastrophic biodiversity collapse and a climate crisis. And um you know, some of the statistics are pretty damning. 59% of invertebrate species have declined over recent decades. And, you know, you hear it all the time, people saying, well, there aren't as many on your windscreen, which actually Bug Life have turned into a survey. If you check out the Bug Life web website, you can get a little thing to put on your number plate. If you clean it at the start of your journey, put the grid on at the end and count how many insects have been squished on your number plate and send that into Bug Life. Um, that's how we're that that's a kind of monitoring thing that we've got going on at the moment to study um, insect declines. But I remember it in my lifetime, I, I grew up in rural Shropshire and I remember cycling down the lanes and, you know, getting bugs in your mouth and in your eyes. And I can do that now and it, and it doesn't happen half as much. And um, yeah, it's quite it's quite shocking, really. 97 percent of the UK's wildflower rich grasslands have been lost since the 1930s. So that's the decline of the species, the decline of the habitat. And this is serious because, you know, it, it's 
it's a it's a house of cards and it's all it, it's potentially all tumbling away and eight and it's shown by 80 percent of our british plants are insect pollinated so if we don't have our pollinators we don't have our plants and there is some evidence that insect pollinated plants are declining faster than wind and water pollinated plants the value of insect pollination to uk agriculture estimated at 510 million per annum and essentially, it's a story of habitat fragmentation. It's pushed our pollinators into, into little islands of habitat in an, with the countryside around them or urban areas around them becoming increasingly hostile and impermeable. So that's what Beelines is hoping to achieve, to, to, to break uh, insects, pollinators and other wildlife out of those islands and enable movement across the landscape, enable them to adapt to climate change. Um, and search for a mate, search for food. So uh, forgive me, sometimes I'll go off, I'm looking at some little notes just to jog me on, on what, to, uh, on, in case I forget. But that's our guide, that, that's the Beeline's guiding principles there. And there's, there's real opportunity here with the Beeline's network. We're working to get it integrated into the, out, the new ELM scheme, the new environmental land management schemes, um, which are replacing uh, CAP and, and BPS. Uh, common agricultural policy and basic payment scheme and it's and it is in countryside stewardship already there are the pollinator packages in the countryside stewardship scheme which bug life helped create it could also overlap with other habitat connectivity data sets there are a lot of um, these nature maps um, happening and it's not to say that they're competing but they can definitely overlap and complement each other so there's the natural england national habitat nature network the wildlife trust nature recovery network rspb futurescapes uh, and there's, there's more um, and essentially where they overlap we could have real priority areas and use them as leverage to gain funding for project bids and such like so they can they can really um complement each other And then to drill down, so that's the national picture. Seven Bee Lines is now Shropshire's contribution to that network. So it's a it's one year green recovery challenge funded project. It ends in March 2022, which is scarily close now. Um, and uh, it, it was one of the shovel ready projects that that Boris was talking about. Um, but yes, we've we've gone in and uh, with our delivery partner Shropshire Wildlife Trust, who have helped us on the ground. Um, in terms of engagement and ecological advice and uh, and also green hay sites. I'll get on to that later. And Bridge North Town Council and Telford, Town, Telford and Reeking Council have put up sites and have agreed to management plans um, and have created species rich grassland. We've also worked with uh, a private estate up um, just below Bridge North, the Apley Estate, and we're working with um, another estate in North Shropshire, um, helping to create, to revert arable margins back to permanent wildflower rich grassland. So as I said, Shropshire's part in the Bee Lines network. So you might see that map there and recognize uh, some places. My face is over half of that map. I'll just move me over there. Um, we've been focusing on this area this year. So Telford down to Bridge North. Um, but we have been working to have spillover benefits to the rest of the county. So we've been hosting webinars, um, hosting training sessions, um, chatting, going along to local events, uh, chatting to people and um, seeing if we can get everyone involved in building this um, pollinator wildlife highway. And um, these are our sites. I'm sorry, these maps are terrible. There's, uh, I'm terrible at maps and we have we do have a mapping person in, in, in Bug Life, but uh, I didn't want to hassle him. So I just cobbled together some Google maps of our sites. Um, but down here, you've got you've got Bridge North and these little orange dots. You've got Well Meadows, which we're actually working on tomorrow. We're running um, we're running a, a meadow makers, a mini meadow makers workshop down there tomorrow and um, creating some bare ground and putting some seed down there tomorrow. And Grove Park as well in Bridge North. Uh, we've created those sites. And then up here is uh, the large species rich uh, grassland creation that we've kick started uh, with a landowner up there. And then heading up further north to Telford and the Maidley area, we've been working in Rough Park and enhancing um, a section of species, just under three hectares of species rich grassland up there. And there's more to come. Like I said, there's another estate owner up in the north uh, near Ellesmere. And we're also working with Dorley Town Council in putting some more 
uh, pollinator friendly flower beds uh, along the high street there and putting in a pollinator garden in Dawley Town Park. So restoration using green hay. So before I get on, a lot of you uh, might know this, but um, I'll, I'll just run briefly through what, what we've been doing in the project. So the first picture that's come up is uh, yellow rattle, uh, Renanthus minor. Uh, it's a particularly important plant. It's a hemiparasitic plant. So it means it gets part of its nutrients from parasitizing, parasitizing the roots of grasses. And um, it's been nicknamed the meadow maker because through it doing that, it reduces uh, and I suppose restrains the grasses, restrains that vigorous growth uh, and weakens them. So allows more space for the more delicate wildflowers to thrive. So having that as, as a tool in, uh, in your toolkit for meadow creation is very important. So green hay, so this is our donor site, as we call it. So this is Lightmore Nature Reserve in Telford. So it's, it's um, I think it's owned by the council, but leased to Shropshire Wildlife Trust. So we worked with Shropshire Wildlife Trust to, to identify this site and, and use it as, as a donor site. As you can see, it's full of beautiful flowers and there's a lot of yellow rattle in there as well. So we're using this as a seed source. So in July, uh, before the seeds have dropped from the flowers, we cut that hay, we take it fresh within a day um, over to the receptor site um, that has been prepared, ready for this green hay to be spread on it so that the seeds can drop out and um, establish themselves on that site and grow there. It's, um, it's probably, it's a really beneficial way to do meadow creation because you know you're getting local provenance seed, you know it's from the local area and it's adapted to conditions. So this is the ground prep on the receptor site. Um, you have to get a real short sward and then create about 50 to 75% bare ground, but depending on what your starting point is, this was quite a dense grass sward. So you want to open up a lot of um, bare soil for seed to soil contact. And then this is contractor mowing, mowing light more ready to be taken over to uh, the receptor site. And then we used volunteers. We used a, a group of Shropshire Wildlife Trust volunteers who came along and helped us um, spread, hand spread green hay over, over a field. That's Caitlin, who works with me. So it's me and Caitlin based in Shropshire. Um, I'm the project officer. Caitlin's the conservation assistant. And um, yeah, she, she was having a great time. Uh, the other fields, the bigger fields, did get done by machinery, but we, um, we spread that one by hand. And then restoration using wildflower seed. So um, green hay is a finite resource, as is everything. And uh, you also, there are only a few sites and you can't use them continuously. I think the guidance is if you cut hay off, off uh, a site and use it as, as green hay, you are taking all the seed input off that site for that year. So you can't go back there within another few years. I think they say three years. And so in some cases, it, you, you have to use wildflower seed important that it's a UK province. And this is Grove Park. So again, the ground prep, creating that bare ground. And then we use people power to get that seed, seed on the ground. So some local people turned up, some local uh, children, families from around the, the area and uh, got involved with sowing a wildflower seed mix, sowing yellow rattle and doing some plug planting as well. Uh, and the town council got involved as well, which was great. It, um, they've been really great and they're, they're looking, they're addressing some of the management of their, some of their sites throughout Bridge North. So it was brilliant to work with them in creating two uh, wildflower meadow sites. And that's seed spreading in R Rough Park in Telford on a slightly sunnier day. And we've been doing training. So the top picture is a botanical uh, survey training workshop uh, for people to monitor their own meadow creation sites. And then below that is uh, Nigel Jones, who some of you might know, um, Shropshire based entomologist. He's a dipter specialist, the fl uh, true fly specialist. And uh, he ran some incredible workshops for us. Um, one online webinar, which I encourage you to go and look at if you're interested in knowing more about pollinator groups. And um, he ran people through the differences and how to tell the key pollinator groups mainly so that people could carry out uh, the UK pollinator monitoring scheme. It's a 10 to 15 minutes um, monitoring scheme. You just grab your patch of flowers and you record what pollinators you see within, a 10, min within 10 minutes. Um, so it's a nice bit of citizen science and we want as many people doing it as possible really. 
um, around the UK to kind of get an idea of, of, of how our pollinators is doing. And we've been spreading the word. So um, going to local events, doing our own pop up events, um, getting people to make pollinator pledges, including in uh, DEFRA Environment Minister uh, Rebecca Pau, who actually lives on a bee line. And um, we got her to commit to creating a wildflower meadow on her, on her own land, as well as bending her ear a bit about policy. Um, but yes, so we've been spreading the word around the county as much as possible as well. And lastly, the Bee Lines is all about people power. So if you're doing something in your patch, please do add your project to our map. It's an interactive map online. You can see where the Bee Line goes, see, see if you live on it, add your project. Um, and uh, yeah, so whatever you're doing, if it's in your garden, if it's on your farm, stick it on there. At the moment, we've got, uh, I think we've got over 1,500 hectares logged on there that people have done um, across the UK. And there's definitely a lot more out there. What I would say is this is just a strategic area where we get the most bang for our buck of putting this habitat in. Um, obviously, it's important to create wildflower areas wherever in the landscape. Um, this is just um, a strategic map of, of where we think it could be most beneficial to put wildflowers in. So let's get on to pollinators and hedgerows. So what is a pollinator? So the National Pollinator Strategy says that there's 1,500 pollinator species in the UK and they're all invertebrates. Um, in, other, in other places across the world, you might have um, mammals and birds, hummingbirds and bats, uh, but here it's, it's the job of the inverts. And just to go through the four stages of, of what a pollinator is, um, just uh, something that comes along, transfers pollen, um, transfer of pollen onto an insect or a vector, transport port of pollen by that insect, um, the pollen transport transfer of the pollen from the vector to the stigma of the flower, and then the deposited pollen affecting the fertilization of the ovules. So we have we have a lot, um, and there are a lot of uh, pollinators. There are some of the the big hitters, the famous ones like the bees. That you might think of immediately and then the less less so the flies um i was watching a stephen fork webinar stephen fork um wrote the guide to um bees for the uk and uh he was saying that there's more like probably six thousand pollinators in the uk when you start thinking about the flies the beetles butterflies moths wasps and, and of course the bees and um Bees are among our best pollinators. They're just, just quite well designed for it. They've got these, this relationship um, with uh, plants that means that they are quite, they can be quite flower um, specific. They uh, move methodically through the landscape, collecting, uh, supping, supping on nectar and collecting um, pollen. So they are, they are very effective. And then you have other species, um, Flies are very good pollinators. Uh, some of them do move around like the hoverflies and others are actually duped into pollination by being tricked. So some flowers may uh, pose as their, their mate or some of the orchids, um, or they may um, Im imitate their, their food or their egg laying sites to trick them into it. Um, beetles, um, again, possibly not counted as among the most effective pollinators, but when they're on mass, they definitely will be adding to the, to the transfer of pollen. So the umbellifers, things like that, there's a beetle pictured there. I, that's not a sol soldier beetle, I don't think, but um, the umbellifers, things like the carrot, you know, wild carrot, um, hogweed, cow parsley, those big open flowers that are basically landing pads, um, hoverflies love them, flies love them. And, and you often see loads of soldier beetles all over them, popularly called bonking beetles, because that's what they do a lot. But um, when they get to that density, there's obviously a lot of pollen moving around. Um, they may not be visiting the flower to do that, but it, but it is happening. Um, and then, of course, the butterflies as well and, and the moths. And just to note that bees are among the best pollinators. Uh, there are around 270 species bee in the UK, and that's more than just the honeybee. Now, I say that because we've been doing uh, chatting to the public a lot. We've been working with schools a lot. And there is still this overriding thing that um, everyone knows about the honeybee. And, and honeybees are great. 
but they are essentially a farmed insect in, in many ways. You know, they are it, they are human. Uh, apart from the wild honeybees, you know, if we're putting hives in the landscape, we are putting another another animal in the landscape that's using its resources. And it's a great thing to do, but we have to be aware of, of habitat provision for that and also remembering our wild bees and, and what they need um, and the, the nectar and the pollen that they need as well. Um, so just to whiz round, we've got, I'm, I'm not sure what type, a little uh, mining bee um, at, at the top right there, down to a beetle, fly, um, uh, the hoverfly in a, a little, con, uh, con, no, it's not a conobie, um, it could be a heath bumblebee and a holly blue um, around the edge there. So what do pollinators need? So they need more than just flowers. And um, I know that's what I've been talking about a lot and that's what we're doing with our projects, but that's just one um, piece of a puzzle that pollinators need. There's a huge diversity of pollinators and even with it, within one species, a huge diversity of what they require because of their complex life cycles. So flowers, um, they need a lot of flowers. They need a lot of specialist flowers. They need a lot of diversity in flowers and abundance. Um, moving down to what they need for reproduction. So host plants, larval food plants, nesting sites, um, specific micro habitats, um, you know, prey species, um, leaves at the leaf cutter bee, for example, uh, needs to needs to have that for, for reproduction. And then moving over to supplements, so additional food, nesting materials, um, hibernation sites. So there's that triangle to think about. And all of that needs to be provisioned for um, for a pollinator with, within the landscape and, and fairly, you know, close um, within a, within a, a, a smallish area. So moving on to hedgerows, I've got this little side here that just says life on the edge. Um, I grew up in rural Shropshire, just on the Wales border. That picture there is a picture of the landscape that um, I call home. And it's, it's very beautiful. Um, you know, it's soft rolling hills, lots of trees and hedgerows. It is, it is an intensive area. There, there's a, quite a lot of intensive farming there. Um, my dad and my granddad and my great granddad farmed up there. And uh, when I hear my dad talking about what it was like in his youth, it's like he's talking about a different landscape. Um, you know, peewits, peewit chicks running around his feet, um, wildflower meadows. I, there's none of that. There's not really any of that up there now. And the hedges, they, they look nice there, but they, they are quite, into, they're intensively managed. They're, they're flailed every year. Um, in the winter, they're very boxy and they've, they've grown to be quite gappy and, um, and created that knuckle of, of the flail line. Um, but at this time of year, they're, they're bountiful and they're bursting and there's these lovely hedge banks, steep hedge banks. So all of these pictures are pictures that I've taken wandering around home. And I guess what it is, is that they're life on the edge, um, life on the hedge. They're the, they're the last bastions of biodiversity sometimes in, in, in fairly intensively managed landscapes. And um, they can they can show us what our ancient countryside would have looked um, in the top right there, there's a wood anemone, um, an ancient woodland indicator plant, quite a slow growing map forming plant. And I took a picture of that in the base of, of one of the hedgerows, uh, just undisturbed ground um, that's, that indicates an ancient habitat. So these hedges really are um, host to a lot of diversity. And um, I read an article during lockdown and at the time in the first lockdown, I lived in, in Shropshire and in, in Staffordshire in a very intensively farm landscape. And I read an article about how people were out connecting with nature with more, but that, hedge, that hedgerows were actually the kind of only place you could get your nature connection in some ways. And, and I definitely found that. I found that I was getting all my wildlife uh, sightings and fixes from the hedgerows because um, that's that's where stuff is still able to cling on in those protected, undisturbed habitats. So the importance of hedgerows, as, as I've said there, really, as part critically important as part of a habitat mosaic, um, the diversity they bring to a landscape. So if you've got uh, a hay meadow or a species rich grassland or semi-improved grassland butting up to a hedgerow, you've already got um, a nice diversity of habitats that can support some complex and differing life cycles in invertebrates. 
as corridors between habitats, so um, between some of our woodland sites or scrub sites, and they're particularly important in intensive agricultural landscapes. And their aesthetic value and their traditional value. So why are they good for pollinators? So these are some of the key things, um, that, you know, the key reasons why they're good for, for pollinators. Forage, um, providing nectar, nesting sites, uh, microclimates, um, larval food plants, flight paths, and all of those together meet these complex life cycle requirements in vertebrates. So I've blown past them there, but I'll, um, I'll go through them now. Uh, just that little bottom picture is one that I took. It wasn't actually on a hedgerow. I've kind of cheated a little bit. It was in, it was in a coppice woodland where a stool had fallen over and um, uh, it's a little mining bee uh, burrowing away. Um, it was quite a sweet picture. So hedgerows as a nectar source. So let's let's start at the top of that triangle with the um, with the provision of, of flowers. So hedgerows can be just an absolute haven of floral di diversity. And if you are either gapping up a hedgerow or, or creating a new hedgerow, it's important to think about a blossom sequence if you can. So, you know, the pillars of our hedgerow communities tend to be blackthorn and hawthorn, which are amazing plants. Um, but they alone, they do provide a short time of, of, of nectar provision. So if we can boost those with some other species to, to provide early nectar forage um, to, down to later in the season, then that, that's fantastic. So not all of these species will be suitable uh, for, for where you might be um, or you may not see them. But gorse, I mean, gorse is flowering now. The, uh, I was walking around home the other day and uh, there's gorse flowering on, on one of the fields. Cherry plum provides a beautiful blossom before the blackthorns out. Goat willow and grey willow, if you go and stand under them in early spring, you will hear the sound of queen bumblebees uh, feeding. They've just come from hibernation and, and are feeding up. Um, so that's one of my first things in, in on a cold day and you start hearing that it's the it's the sign of things to come the sign of life uh, of life coming forward uh blackthorn obviously one of the pillars of the hedgerow community um told apart from hawthorn uh if you're ever struggling blackthorn the flowers come before the leaves um and some of you may intimately know blackthorn by getting it in your hand or something I've, that's certainly happened to me not a pleasant experience, but an absolutely fantastic hedgerow plant. Um, crab apple, again, providing uh, blossom, but uh, also some fruit later in the year, which uh, a lot of butterflies like rotting fruit. Field maple hawthorn, um, a, tree, a, bush, a bush that I'm particularly fond of. Um, the smell of it at that time of year is really the sign that, that summer's on the way. And gelder rose and elder and dogwood taking us kind of into... June time. Um, so that's quite a long, a long uh, blossom sequence. But then bolster that with uh, some of the climbers, so like ivy, um, bryonies, uh, honeysuckle, and that bee there. Uh, I mean, in the top right there, there's a queen bumblebee uh, feeding on willow. But here we've got female ivy mining bee, um, which we actually saw when we were at Grove Park to the meadow creation there. And this is one of our, I think it's our latest emerging bee. It's a solitary bee, um, nests in sandy banks. And uh, they emerge kind of September time and uh, ivy mining bee, because they're strongly associated with, with feeding on ivy. So hedgerows, are hedgerows with ivy and are bound to be a huge boost for, for, that, for that species. Um, just check on it. So, um, and then let's not forget about the flowery margins along hedgerows. Um, the other thing to know about pollinators is that there's quite a diversity of tongue lengths or mouth parts. And uh, some of you may know that and some of you don't, but when, when you do know it, you start to look at things very differently. You start to look at flowers very differently. So I, there's a little table there which just shows some of the lengths of our bee species tongues. So the top there, Bombus hotorum, is our garden bumblebee and comes in with the longest tongue. And uh, just in the middle photo with the foxgloves, that's a garden bumblebee there, and you can see its tongue 
hanging below as it as it's flying there visiting visiting the foxglove so like these deep tubular flowers um and then i think it's it's moving through to red-tailed bumblebee common carder bee you can see the common carder bee in that top right photo uh, also has quite a long tongue and then heading down to early bumblebee and then lastly the buff-tailed and white-tailed bumblebees who have um have shorter tongues the buff-tailed bumblebee has got quite strong jaws though so they practice nectar robbing um so it's it's most noticeable on comfrey if you're if you're in a patch of comfrey if you have a look you'll notice that there's holes on at the base of the flowers where the buff-tailed bumblebee has chewed a hole and just bypassed all the what the flower has been hoping would happen, the bee going in and picking up pollen, bypassed it all, gone straight in at the bottom and, and, and nicked the nectar because they don't have a tongue long enough to, to reach it. So when you think about that, you know, the hedgerow plants like the blackthorn and the hawthorn all tend to be open plants and they're all quite good for short-tongued pollinators or, or the flies which or the hoverflies, which tend to have like a, a short kind of pad, which they, you'll see it pad, padding around. Um, and then these hedgerow plants uh, can be really, really diverse and have uh, quite a lot of deep tubular flowers, uh, which are really good for the, for the longer tongued um, species. So here we've got the, the brimstone on red campion and we've got a thick legged flower beetle shoving its head right into a red campion there after, after the nectar. Um, and then at the bottom there, the hoverfly on, on the umbrella for head pad it, padding around. Something up there. So that diversity of, of plants on offer is, is really crucial. Um, diversity equals diversity, basically. Hedgerows as a nesting site. Um, so again, they just provide quite a lot of niches. Um, a few years ago, I, when I was uh, working as a ranger with the National Trust, we planted a hedge a few years earlier and we went back to just size some of the growth at the end of summer. Uh, and um, Oh, well, it must have been mid-ish summer, just to give the tree some space. And we came across a carder nest. We left it alone and uh, they'll create um, kind of a, you know, pull together to card, card the grass into, into a nest uh, in long grass. So hedgerows can provide that. They also provide undisturbed ground for hibernating, hibernating queen bumblebees. So a lot of that leaf litter um, is great. Rot holes for hoverflies. So that tangled heart of the hedge. Um, if there's any kind of holes with water in, or if even if there's standing deadwood in some of the standard trees or branches, if, if it's in the sun, it's great for our aerial nesting solitary bees. And hedge banks, as we saw before, that little mining bee, if you've got a steep hedge bank and it's in a, in a sunny spot and it's got some loose sandy ground, it's going to be great for mining bees. Um, and also through hedgerows, they're going to be great cover for, for mice and voles. And uh, queen bumblebees, when they're emerging, um, will often use uh, old mouse burrows um, as 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 nesting sites. So you'll uh, you'll often see it early in the year. You'll see a big fat bumblebee queen kind of quartering over the ground. And then if you follow her and watch her, you will see her land and go down a hole and hit, and she'll stay there and wait. And she'll be checking it out and she'll come buzzing back out. Uh, that's what she's doing. She's just checking uh, and checking the suitability for a nesting site. So hedgerows provide those um, as well. Hedgerows as shelter. So this is, is pretty critical um, in a landscape that is changing due to um, climate change. Um, hedges shape microclimates. Uh, pollinators don't like bad weather um, and they find it difficult in a, in a strong breeze. So hedges are pretty crucial windbreaks uh, on days like that. And um, they can often, I'm just gonna have a sip of water. I can feel my voice going. <clears throat> they make for a great windbreak and they can often um, make the, you know, a sheltered sunny spot uh, where, the, you know, that's protected against the wind can often be five degrees warmer uh, than, you know the surrounding area so they, they provide these little pockets of, of perfect uh conditions for for pollinators to continue their activity which is essential um particularly bumblebees they i think one of the quotes is the bee if you look at the bee it's something like if you look at the bee it, it shouldn't fly it doesn't make any sense for it to fly but the bee doesn't know that so it keeps on flying anyway 
and they are huge creatures and they need a, they need a lot of energy to to keep moving around keep foraging so if they can't if they can't forage that's that's quite critical so if there is something providing an area for them even in bad weather or breezy weather to be able to keep continue feeding then that that's that's great likewise on the flip side on really hot days um a lot of pollinators don't don't like the you know the activity will reduce when the weather gets too hot so a hedge can provide shade provide shade and provide a cooler um microclimate so that pollinators can keep can keep moving um and that is going to be crucial um you know the fact that we need more trees in our in our agricultural landscapes and, and more hedges uh to to create those pockets of of shade and of, of coolness in in what could be what is becoming uh, a more hostile landscape as as our as our climate warms up and we get these uh dry hot summers i'll just check that uh hedgerows as baby food so larval food plants i mean there are just an incredible amount like yeah that's if you start looking into it and, and start looking at some of the classic hedgerow plants like, like blackthorn and willow and hawthorn, you will find countless moth species and such like that are, are using them. Um, these are just some of the uh, some of the ones that you're more likely to see in a, in a couple of specialists that I've thrown in there. So holly blue, um, little butterfly, uh, two generations. The spring generation will feed on holly and uh, the second generation Will, the larvae will feed on ivy. Um, so they, you know, two potential hedgerow species. And uh, if if they don't, if they don't have those, they will move to um, bramble or gorse. So they are quite um, hedgerow associated. We've also got the orange tip butterfly. I love seeing these in early spring. Uh, the males have the orange tip on their on their wing. And they've got this gorgeous underwing uh, in that top right picture. You can see it, that speckled green underwing. And their, their food plants, their larval food plants, are um, cuckoo flower, which, which grows in um, damp meadows, that lovely um, delicate pink flower that you can see often in rushy areas. I think it's also called ladies' smock. Um, and, but they also use uh, garlic mustard or jack in the hedge, or jack by the hedge. Uh, which is this plant um, just below the orange tip pictured there with the nettly leaves. And you'll see that, you'll see that in hedgerows. It's got a tall plant with these small white flowers and that's the larval, you know, the orange tip uses that as a larval food plant. So at the right time of year, if you're wandering along and you just have a, just gently have a little look at the top of those, of those flowers. And sometimes you'll see the orange tips, a little tiny orange egg just put on the side of the stem, just sticking out from the stem. If you look on cuckoo flower or on um, Jack Jack in the Hedge, you might see it. They also use honesty, um, a purple flower with the big silvery seed pods um, as, as a food plant as well. And the brown hair streak, uh, not in Shropshire, um, and I don't think, uh, beautiful butterfly with a strong association with, with, with hedgerows. It lays its eggs on young blackthorns, so you can see the the but the, uh, the brown hair streak at the bottom there, and then above it the little egg laid on on blackthorn. So it it likes a well managed hedge. It doesn't like a flailed hedge. Um, it needs that young growth of, of blackthorn. Uh, the small egg uh, small egg moth, another um, quite rare uh, moth that's very very associated with hedgerows, uh, mainly blackthorn. Um, but we'll also use hawthorn um, and spindle, apple, and grey willow. So all, you know, fairly common hedgerow species. And then some hedgerows, uh, what I was talking about for all those lovely plants I showed you before that are generally on steep hedge banks, you know, like bush vetch or um, primroses, uh, wood avens, different plants. Sometimes you get those, those verges next to hedgerows, which are kind of dominated by the, perhaps the more thuggish species like hogweed and nettle, but they're still fantastic for, invertebr for invertebrates. You know, red admirals, some of the big red butterflies, red admirals, small tortoiseshell peacock, all use nettle as a, as a larval food plant. And hogweed, uh, the big stands of hogweed are just amazing landing pads for, for hoverflies, um, flies. You can see countless, hogweed is always worth a look. 
at um, if you're looking for insects. Um, so yes, they are, they can dominate and overtake, but there's definitely space for them. They are very, very important uh, plants to have. Hedgerows as highways. Um, so there was a study done in 2011 by, uh, I think Louise Cranmer, and um, it tested how much uh, bumblebees were using hedgerows um, as flight paths. And the really interesting thing about it is that they tested hedgerows, and they also tested artificial linear features. And it showed that both of them influenced the flight paths of bumblebees. So whether or not it's providing food, they are definitely providing a navigational aid as well. Um, there's some really good stuff on, on bee navigation in one of Dave Goldson's books. I can't remember which one right now, but it's, it's very interesting. So that, that's really important. They, they're obviously used to map the countryside by, by pollinators. And, um, but they're also, as we've said before, they provide those microclimates, they provide those forage pathways. And uh, part of this study was testing uh, whether that would have an effect on plants. So they planted experimental patches of, of a salvia species. And um, they found that the plants that were planted near hedgerows or at the confluence of hedgerows were, had more increase, had increased pollinator activity and increased seed set. So, you know, the hedgerows were actually influencing the flight paths of bumble bumblebees and in turn influencing the successfulness of, of, of associated plants with those, with those pollinators nearby. So that's, um, that's fairly, uh, yeah, amazing. And then a, a later study in 2016 found that moths also used hedgerows as flight paths. So navigational aids um, as well. So will any hedge do? Can, can all of that um, happen around any hedge? So there was, another, there was another study, Garrett et al in 2017, that tested um, whether the species richness of a hedge made a difference to pollinators and they, they were specifically using bumblebees again. So they studied poor hedges and good hedges and what made a good hedge was more than three woody species with gaps less than two meters in and then a poorer hedge had you know one or two woody species and quite large gaps. And they found a significant difference. More than twice as many bumblebees uh, were spotted on transects near good quality hedges as there were on poor. So it is a case of you can, um, well-managed hedgerows are better than, than a poorly managed hedgerows, even though all of them do, do provide a resource, especially an intensively managed um, landscape. And hoverflies were found in that study to be visiting um, the understory flowers more than the hedgerow flowers, which is, is also quite interesting. And the other thing that that study found was that the abundance of pollinators observed on hedgerows in areas with lower local proportions of semi-natural habitat. So hedgerows that were probably in more intensive agricultural landscapes were found to have more pollinator activity, which is a phenomenon known as ecological contrasts. And that's the hypothesis that if you're going to do conservation work, it's probably going to be most beneficial where there is the least habitat for, the, for, those, for those species. So that ecological contrast is quite uh, noticeable. So that just shows you how crucial hedgerows are for making our agricultural landscape permeable to pollinators and other wildlife. I took the opportunity here to uh, put the, the hedge that we laid on the hedgerow workshop that we did, which I was pretty proud of. I think, I'm not sure, but I think um, uh, Richard might be on this uh, this uh, webinar who, who ran the course and it was a fantastic course. Again, I recommend going, taking that space if you can. Um, so yeah, this is an example of, of, of laying a hedge. Um, apparently there were some mistakes, but I think, uh, I think we've done a pretty good job there. And um, this just, rejuvenates that hedge, allows for that new growth, allows for that nice billowy look um, in the summer and also means a lot of blossom production and fruit production. And um, I was re reading James Rebank's book actually, a pastoral, English pastoral, um, last night and he was talking about hedgerows and talking about the tangled heart of the hedgerow. So, you know, so this this beautiful billowing hedgerow with a real tangled heart that's providing a lot of niches in there, a lot of shelter. Um, and this is what laying a hedge does, just kind of rejuvenates it and gives it new life. So um, 
if we can be doing that more, um, then yeah, that, that would be fantastic. And I thought I'd round off with a, with a slide called Tales from the, the Hedge. So these are two um, plant pollinator relationships that I just love and uh, find really, really fascinating. So these are two hedgerow plants. Uh, well, they're not hedgerow, specifically hedgerow plants, but you will see them associated with them a lot. I see the one on the left, wild arum, arum maculatum, or some people call it jack in the pulpit or um, lords and ladies. Um, that's it earlier in the year when it's flowering, I suppose. But um, later in the year, you'll probably recognise it as the pillar with a lot of red berries around it. Um, this has got a really fascinating association with, with a pollinator. So that purple pillar in the middle is called the spadix, known as the spadix, and the, the leaf sheath around the outside is known as the space. Now, what that spadix does, it's trying to attract a fly to pollinate it. That spadix emits a, a horrible smell, a smell of ammonia and excre excrement, and it also heats up. Um, they found it through infrared uh, cameras that that heats up and can raise the air temperature around it up to uh, up to 15 degrees Celsius higher. Um, and they're trying to attract an owl midge. So it comes in, the owl midge comes in attracted by the smell and the heat, and it hits the space, which is like a slide, and slips down to the base of that plant, where there are three sets of flowers waiting for it. The top set of flowers are sterile male flowers that have just formed a fringe uh, of hairs around the top, which trap the owl midge in. It drops to the bottom and at the bottom are the female flowers waiting to be pollinated. The owl midge walks around in there, obviously uh, depositing any pollen it has on its body in there. And then before it's released, the middle flowers that are above the male, uh, female flowers release more pollen, scatter it over the owl midges, the top flowers wither away to, to let the owl midges out and off they go load, laden up with new pollen ready to, to pollinate the next wild arum plant. And um, yeah, I just love that, that, you know, plants are always trying to avoid pollinating themselves. So they create these weird, they've evolved these weird and wonderful ways of, of stopping that happening. And often that goes down the special specialization route with, with a pollinator. And I'll just wrap up quickly with, um, with the, the foxglove. Uh, so here's the garden bumblebee visiting the foxglove. And the foxglove has evolved to utilize the, method, the methodical approach of bumblebees. So it wants a large insect. If you look inside a foxglove, there's a, there's a guard of hairs, which kind of deters smaller insects going in. It wants a bulky insect to go in and pollinate it and get the nectar reward. So if you notice, if you watch a bumblebee, it will start at the bottom of a foxglove and slowly work its way to the top. So a foxglove has developed uh, a very interesting way of avoiding self-pollination. When the flowers first open, and as you know from a foxglove, they open from the, the bottom up. When they first open, it's just the stamens there uh, with, the, with the pollen on. Uh, they eventually wilt away and wither, and then the stigma protrudes past, pat, protrudes past them and opens up with the receptive, the receptive area to be pollinated. So as the plants mature and open, it ends up with the more mature plants at the more mature flowers at the bottom being functionally female and the newer plants at the top being functionally male. So when a bee has, comes to a foxglove from a previous plant, it's going with pollen from the previous plant down to the female plants at the bottom, pollinating them and then moving up, hitting the male plants at the top and getting new pollen to go to the next foxglove. And I just think that's uh, just incredible. And uh, there's lots of these associations happening around the countryside in hedgerows, in all habitats. And um, as you start to realise these little interactions, you realise how special um, hedgerows and other habitats are and how we must preserve them for these fascinating tales. I'll also just say recommended reading. I've talked about Dave Golson, love all his books. Um, so check them out. There's lots of cool stories in there. I'm delving in and out of Pollinators and Pollination by Jeff Ollerton at the moment. And that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, from about pollinators and pollination around the world. And I'll finish there and say thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, if you would like to know more about the Seven Bee Lines project, please do email me or give me a call. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. We've still got events to go. We've got an online, we've got online talks happening this winter. 
we've got some volunteering opportunities potentially next spring and um, we do have a few funds left if there are any interested particularly any interested landowners out there who are interested in putting more wildflowers on their farm then uh, then yeah let me know but thank you very much and thanks to CPRE. Thank you very much, Kate. What a, what a wonderful and, and interesting talk. What was particularly interesting uh, for me was to know more about how many uh, pollinator species there are and how diverse their needs are in particular. That's coming from a layman who knows almost nothing about pollinators. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I noted your pun. I uh, expect it was intended of life on the hedge. Um, yeah. I will say that it is most likely going to be stolen for future publications, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, now, I would like to ask if there are any questions um, from uh, those attending. Um, right about now, you should see on your screen a request to unmute. If you do have some questions, please fire away. We'll try to coordinate the best we can if you all come in one uh, flow at the same time, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So uh, are there any, anybody who wants to ask any questions? Yes. <laughs> Alison. Sorry, thank you. Do you mind, do I need to on video? No, go, no, absolutely, go away. Okay, this is absolutely brilliant, Kate. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely brilliant. I'm a beekeeper, but I, the first thing I do is always talk about all the other bees and make sure people know about all that. So I'm just, I was clapping when you were saying all that other stuff. Um, my question is very basic, possibly too, too um, basic for, for, for this, but I'm going to try. My sister lives in Devon. And she has just spent a lot of money on ordering 200 um, I bear root native hedgerow species, um, including all the ones you had up, plus I think probably about 15 other ones, she, a huge amount of research. She's about to, she's prepared the ground really well um, in her bottom field, um, but she's over-researched and got completely stuck. She does not know how to treat them once they're in. She has variously been advised to leave them, cut them in half, or goodness knows what. She's not intending to layer, lay them, sorry, um, because it's too much work, etc. cetera, or, or they're different species. And I wondered if anybody here has any advice. Once they're dug in, shortly when she gets them, what should she do for the best result? Any ideas, please? Yes. Um, I will just uh, so although I've done this talk I must say I, I've not done much hedgerow management or planting I'm actually going to volunteer and do something with CPRE next uh, next year mm -hmm. uh, what, I, what I have done so, she, so she's put them in she's not intending to lay um, but she's worried that she put too many in no, 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 no. She's done lots of research. She knows when she gets them, not yet, because um, they're bare root. Um, she knows, she, she researched how, the distance between them. What she is confused about is what should she do once they're planted? Does she leave them? Does she cut them in half now, as one site website suggests? Does she cut them in half in spring, as another website? I don't know which has suggested. Or my guys, I'm London National Trust, I've asked my guys locally, and they say just leave, leave it completely. No idea if it matters or doesn't matter. I just wondered if anybody here, <laughs> there, has any ideas. <laughs> I've not place. really heard of the, the cutting. So the, the hedge, the hedges that I have planted, we we've left, but we have gone back to clear around them to stop them getting smothered by um by vegetation. So we've just, you know, yeah. taken take visited every year just to, to clear around the base and make sure that they're that they're all okay. Um but no, I haven't done any cutting. I don't know if that's more of a question for the hedgerow guys. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Can, can I can I ask one, please? Yes, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I might just be able to help on that last one. I mean, I'd be inclined to leave them. All the hedges that we have put in, and we've put a lot in in various farms, is um, pl plant them and um, double double spaced, um, preferably, and, and I stagger them up the row. But then I just I just leave them, and, and I wouldn't be inclined to do any laying or anything you know for, for, for quite a number of years let them get well established uh, but thank you that was my gut reaction thank you very very much but what I, one of the things um kate it was absolutely fantastic that uh, a, a really inspirational talk especially i lo i loved your stories at the end um uh, professionally i use a, a piece of software um mapping software called the land app 
and this week it had an upgrade. And one of the things that it's got layers on, like National Grid and things like that. But um, you'll be pleased to hear, if you didn't know already, that the Bug Life, all the maps are now available on the land app, the actual B lines. They're actually Rick. mapped on there. And, and if oh, anyone is interested, um, I, I can sort of point people in the direction or, 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 or share a screen with somebody one day. But I think, Kate, if I get in touch with you independently, I can perhaps show you what they've done because it's brilliant. It's That's really fantastic. I actually, shamefully, I didn't know that. That's probably uh somebody probably my boss actually that's uh that's getting all that stuff done and getting beelines on these on these mapping apps i do actually use the land app from time to time so i'll i'll get on and have a look but that yeah, that is yeah. brilliant that's great yeah. to hear yeah it's, it's in the in the habitats bit at the at, at the side right. um so so uh, it, rather than a question um i just thought it would help anyone who was interested yeah yeah brilliant thank you yeah, but again, th that's absolutely fantastic. And I put a little question on there earlier on um, saying, have you ever seen a definitive uh, list of sort of the order? You mentioned the order of flowering, and I'm sort of vaguely aware of it. But um, have you ever seen anything sort of written down with the order? In a, in a, it, all right, years change, alter slightly, but... Uh, have you seen anything written down could be useful yeah i mean that that what i put there was listed in the order of of it was listed in the order of the blossom sequence on the slide but if you have a look um there's a lot i mean if you just google uh hedge a hedgerow management on uh, are you a farm are you a landowner a farm yes yeah there's, um i think campaign for farm farming england has got yeah. some good some good uh, pollen things. Bug Life, our own website, has some stuff about hedgerow management for landowners. Um, there's a good one. It's it's Ireland based, but they've got a new hedgerow strategy that's really good as well, and you know applicable to over here. And that'll have lots of advice about blossom sequences and uh, and uh, what what to include include in a hedge. So there's lots of resources. Um, but what I put in the slide there, and if I think this will go on a recording, is was actually in the order of, of the blossom sequence as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's uh, there's there's lots of resources to to go and have a look at, and um, yeah, there's some on our website as well. We've got a farming hub, so if you if you have a look on Bug Life on the farming hub, there's there's lots of stuff on there about different uh, habitats on farmland and how to best manage them for 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 invertebrates. And one last one before I shut up was um, um, I, I, when I was looking earlier on, on the actual bee lines, how, how I mean, we have some land up near um, uh, some Olskut direction and the bee lines are quite close. But uh, how, do you actually have, have to be on the bee line or can you, you know, if you're sort of up two miles away, is that too far? Do you have a rule of thumb? Um, if, if we're going to put funding towards something, it, it has to be on the B line. We have done it where we've worked with a, with a landowner who's partly on the B line. And then, you know, we've helped with some land that's just off the B line, but most of the farm is on the B line. Um, but yeah, if, 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 if we're going to, if we're going to put funding toward, towards an area, it does have to be on the B line, but happy to offer advice to anyone who's just anywhere and wants to, to, um, to do work. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Brilliant. Thank we'll you. We'll go to Dylan and then Lauren. Um, hi, I have, uh, first of all, well done. Um, that was a great talk. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one in terms of engaging uh, farmers and farm managers on um, hedgerow maintenance and creation. Do you register your training events with the organization called BASES so that um, farmers can get uh, continued professional development points? Is that something you do or something you would consider doing? Uh, it's not something that, that, I've, that I've done on, on this project, um, mm. but uh, I don't know if, if someone else has done it within Bug Life, but... Um, Thank you for bringing that up because that is something that I can definitely look into as okay. we are uh, this winter kind of set of webinars that we're doing. We're hoping to do a landowner workshop probably next February about species rich grassland creation uh, and how to 
create a plan on how to move forward and, and what you would need to do to if you're thinking of uh you know creating species rich grazing pasture or species rich hay meadows um and that's probably could is we're looking at potentially a half day workshop so that's something that you know we would love to get landowners involved in so i will okay, look into I, that. yeah thank you very much perfect <laughs> yeah i can i can i can send you i can send you details after this talk about um a route to get into that but i, I think it would be beneficial um with farmers and landowners getting you know, ongoing training. Um, sometimes it's the, the the little incentive that they need um, in order to engage with a wider audience. Um, that was my first question. And, and my second question was around um, ecological islands. So in terms of um, in terms of the bee lines, and I mean, you, get, you gave a great slide about linking key priority habitats. Um, but I suppose rather than... Um, mm, uh, ecological habitats where we have um, ecological islands, for example, um, ancient trees that don't really uh, fall into a woodland category um, mm. because they, they wouldn't have the, the, the surface area to, to be classified as a woodland. Um, how do people with, for example, ancient trees on their properties try and get involved in this? Because um, you know, those trees potentially could be uh, huge, hugely biodiverse, but but obviously if there's no corridors, then then that becomes problematic. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, ancient trees uh, and veteran trees aren't included in the in the habitat mapping for bee lines. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, they are they are very important. They, they have less of a strong so association with with pollinators. They have quite their own kind of specialist association case of, um, of invertebrates. We do have a project that is specifically on ancient uh, trees and veteran trees called Back from the Brink. Okay. Um, and that is that is specifically about uh, the management of, of ancient and veteran trees uh, in the landscape. Um, there's lots, again, lots of resources on the Bug Life website if you, if you look at Back from the Brink as a project. Um, they're releasing lots of management uh, leaflets at the moment and, and how to incorporate them in, um, into the landscape. What they have done is talked about, so for example, on, on parkland uh, that have, perhaps you have surrounding woodland or perhaps you're butting up to meadows or semi-improved grassland. Um, they have talked about creating uh, nectar, I suppose, scrub hotspot. So, uh, putting these stepping stones in in parkland and fencing off an enclosure and putting you know flowering scrub in them um and just making a bit of a stepping stone habitat across across parkland and connecting up these these veteran trees with perhaps woodland that's that's quite a way away through a stepping stone effect um and again hedgerows come into that as well uh but there's definitely more on the website from the back from the brink project um which is yeah specifically looking at those habitats Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Hi, good evening. Um, I was just wondering about the pollinator monitoring, um, monitoring scheme. Did you uh, have further information about that or is it something that we just want to go to a website and have a look? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably get, get the best thing to do is go on the site and have a look because it, it's very, very, it's very, very simple. I've got the, so we did some training courses for it this year um, when the season was out, I've got the app on my phone and it, it's it's really simple to use. Um, it's just a case of, if I can remember rightly, let me look at the app now. Um, so it's fit count, it's flower insect times count. Um, and you choose one species of flower. So you might, in a 50 by 50 centimeter quadrat, um, one species of flower. So it might be knapweed, um, amongst other species you count the flower heads you log all that and then you spend 10 minutes watching it and just um just log if it's a, a bee that's visited i think they split down bumblebee solitary bee um fly um wasp if i can remember <laughs> no that's um, wonderful but if you go on, uh, the app is great. There's a paper form as well. But if you go to the center, it's, it's, it was done by the Center for Ecology and Hydrology.
But if you type in UK POMS, because UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme, it'll come up uh, on the on the site and you know signpost you to the app. And there's a little video on there as well that explains what the methodology is. Um, but yeah, it's a really good survey, just quite simple and just quite a nice way to spend 10 minutes. <laughs> No, we have some students coming, so hopefully I can get them to focus on some areas for us and do a little map of what's coming. So thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you for the question. Oh, obviously to know, it'll, it'll probably, I think it runs from, I think it starts in April, the survey, and runs to sure. September. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question. We could probably got end of time for a few more questions. Um, Charles. Thank you. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I learned a lot about um, what you're doing in bug life, which was completely new to me. But these, the idea of, of cars across the country is absolutely fantastic. As I, and, and I was trying to see whether those corridors came my way, which I didn't see from the maps you showed up. So if we could... If, Martin or someone could um, put the link where we can find those maps online by, by Sarah, perhaps that would be fantastic. But I was going to ask you about the, I think you said that this um, bug life corridors um, are sort of target corridors, presume, and they're three kilometres wide, which seem quite a, a pretty wide tranche of land, really. How much of that potential three kilometre wide highway across the country is actually filled up at the moment with with projects that are providing what you're looking for oh caught me on the hop there i don't i don't i can't give you a figure for that i'm afraid um uh so we uh, what we do have is we have um there's myself in shropshire myself and caitlin working in shropshire um, and there's a team up in, in Scotland uh, working in Dumfries and Galloway. Well, they're actually making the John Muir Way uh, a, a, a pollinator highway as such. Um, there's a team working down in, in Wales around Cardiff, Cardiff and Neath Port Talbot that are doing a beeline stand there. There's a project in Cornwall. Um, there's one coming up in Norfolk. So we're, we're spread about we're spread about the country and then there are other places. What we're really hoping is that Bug Life can't do it all all on our own. Um, it's something that people will have to take up the mantle with as well. So um, I, I, I'm not sure what, I saw that his surname was Steer, but um, the chat that was saying before about it going on the land app, that's brilliant because if it if it's taken up by landowners and if it's incorporated into Elms, which is, is what we're working on at the moment, um, it will be taken up independently of bug life. And then other projects, we were working in the Southwest with Avon Wildlife Trust. Uh, bug life kicked it off, but Avon Wildlife Trust have really taken it on and are following the bee line. And they're doing, I think that's the most developed section of the bee line in, in the UK around, uh, around where Avon yeah. Wildlife Trust are. Um, I can't give you a figure, I'm afraid. Uh, three kilometres does, does seem wide, but when <laughs> we're looking at some of these catastrophic declines, like 97%, loss of, of wildflower rich grasslands three kilometers wide in a in a in a targeted network it is is kind of what needs to, ha to happen and it's 10 percent of 10 percent of that that starts delivering habitat connectivity so i think it's oh, I 300 see. hectares and 10 kilometers so yeah we we we'll probably never reach a point where the entire three kilometer network is full of of wildflower habitat but what we're hoping is that within that three kilometer wide network, we get that stepping stone effect. It might not all be wildflowers, but there'll be significant sites that are developed in there that start, that start yeah. building a, a network. Okay, so that's what I was trying to find out, just how you're going really. And it sounds as though there's a heck of a lot of work for you. There, yeah, there is a lot of work. And, and I mean, there's probably there's probably people working and doing stuff in the beeline that we don't know about as well. So that's what I was saying about uh, the link is in the thing that I will I can send it to Sarah as well to to forward on to to the people on on this talk. Um, it, you know we'd love anybody who's doing meadow creation or you know maybe they're creating a community garden make it maybe they're making their allotments more wildlife friendly. We'd love them to put that on the beeline so that that, that we know about it. 
and the more people that get that get in touch and uh, reach out for advice and such like um it's about enabling enabling everyone to help us build that network as well but yeah it is ambitious there is there is a lot to do but we got to be ambitious now haven't we? <laughs> Absolutely. thank you yeah thank, thank you we'll take one or two more questions if there are any on the table No, if there are any other questions that, that prop to your mind after this talk, uh, Kate's email address is on the screen, so please note it down and feel free to drop it. I guess at this stage, it's, it's uh, time to thank you all for tuning in. Thanks again to Kate for joining us. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us at our next talk by Adele, who's going to tell us all about foraging for food in the hedgerows. That's on the 8th of December. Details are on CPRE Shropshire's website. Until then, take care, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you.